in the morning, some of you might have prayed as you started your day. Some of you had breakfast, some of you didn't. Some of you are wearing the cultural, traditional clothes. Some are in beautiful suits. Some decided to be in this talk and some decided not to be part of this event. Some thought of liking and listening to certain speakers and others perhaps didn't. What enabled us all to do this and make these choices? Is it just something that we do every day and we think every person in the world does the same? Let me tell you not. There is something that enables us to do it all and make those choices. What do we want to eat? What do we want to wear? How do we want to look? Who do we want to listen to? And what do we don't want to listen to? These are all the choices that we make sometimes consciously and sometimes unconsciously. But what enables us? There is a definition of positive peace that enables us to make and take all those choices about what we want to hear, who do we want to interact with, what do we want to eat, how do we want to pray, and what names and titles do we want with ourselves. But when we talk of peace, there are general certain visualizations, imaginations or manifestations of peace. Why does this happen that when we talk about peace, contemplation, happiness, we see an imagery where a person has to be alone, cut off from the day in day out life, sitting somewhere amongst the nature, not saying that you don't get peace by being there. But there is a message that we tend to give that if we want to be peaceful, somehow we'll have to be cut down from our normal lives, somehow we need to be, we need to be done with everything and anything and responsibilities to be at peace. And if we are with our friends, with our colleagues, doing our jobs or maybe with family or friends, we cannot have peace or contemplation for that matter. So this has somehow made this unconscious notion in our minds that if we want to be peaceful, will have to move away from the community, our friends, which I think kind of makes peace an elitist problem. It gives an impression that to be peaceful, you might have to be, you know, getting done with anything and everything, get it all sorted, and then maybe sit alone to have peace. And somehow, you will also understand and also listen to the stories where people will tell you that unless you have economic prosperity and all things sorted, you cannot have peace and peace is something maybe that's not your problem. So I ask you a question, is peace your problem? So I agree with the notion when somebody says that peace is not your problem. Because I believe peace is something that is our solution. Why peace is our solution? So it's not just a theoretical word that we keep on hearing. The terms of mutual respect, respectful coexistence, inclusivity, tolerance are not just the social political words that we tend to use. These are something which are backed by the empirical data and also by the wisdom that we have received over the centuries. The top five happiest countries in the world and the most peaceful countries in the world, their economies are not strong just because their industry is strong. Or they are not just the peaceful societies because their economy is strong. It's vice versa. So peace is that building block 
that provides and enables every individual to perform what he or she wants to perform. So all those individuals, whether activists, writers, all the companies that encourage and back the events that promote, promote peace and tolerance, they are convinced. When we talked about non-violent struggle, or when we talk about Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King or Bacha Khan or anybody, anybody for that matter. They chose to be non-violent not because they were weak. They chose the way of peace because they knew this is something that works. When we talk about our Sufi saints, when we talk about the great writers and intellectuals, why did they have this common message of inclusivity? and taking everyone together along with them. Because that is something which works. And that's also the wisdom of centuries I said, I said in the beginning, suggests. So, when the empirical data backs it, and when they, these words are also good to, you know, when we listen to them, why don't we implement them? What happens? You know, why we do not see this in the society? The reason being is, we tend to make these words or these attitudes more of a theory than the experience. You might not recall who for the first time gave the theory of non-violence, but you definitely remember Mahatma Gandhi as he said, or Martin Luther King for that matter, or Pacha Khan, anybody for that matter, and from your local examples. Why do you remember them? Because they lived that experience. You might not remember who gave the best theory about community support and working and taking care of orphans. But you all remember and know Abdul Sitari because he lived that example. When we come in here this, for this event, there were young volunteers at the stage, at the registration desk they might not remember our news, all of us. But if you had asked them how they are doing and smiled at them and offered your help, they might not remember your name, but they would remember the gesture because they've lived that experience for that moment. So that's what we talk about that making peace an experience. And that's the reason, even today, I remember those teachers more who were kind to me. In addition, of course, they were good at their subjects as well. But their kindness and compassion is something that will stay and is staying with me for the rest of my life. Because I might not be applying the knowledge equation in my life these days. But compassion and kindness is something that I apply every single day. Experience. Creating an experience. How do we create that experience? As I say, how to make peace with it? So that is one question I would want to bring your attention to. How do we create peace? When the life throws troubles at you, violence at you, how do you make peace with it? Why do you make that conscious choice? It's not your limitless magnanimity that you show to have some fruits after the life or something. If you have that, fair enough. But you need to be convinced that the strategy that you have taken is not something, just the magnanimity. It's also something, a conscious choice. Why do we make peace with it? There's a book by Dr. Maria J. Stephen and Dr. Erika, Why Civil Resistance Works. They've analyzed civil movements from 1900 till 2006. And they conclude that movements that had peace and non-violent struggle, they have produced twice better results compared with movements and struggles that had violent element in How that works? How do we make peace? So what do we do is the paradigm shift about things, about everything. Now we have talked about 
lots of things that have happened in the history. We talked about a little empirical data. But let's talk about us, the people sitting here. What do we do when we want to make peace? We were having this conversation. When does this process begin? For example, as children, we used to, as boys, we used to play games in Punjab, in Rawalpindi. You might have heard the names. Pitugara, Bandar Kela, Markutai. All these games had violence as an indigenous component. No wonder such boy would normalize violence when he grows up. But that was a game. But when we say something, we do something. That is a speech act theory by J.L. Austin, British philosopher. When we say something, we do something. You remember those poems? Cham cham cham, mera toot gaya button. Amni maarengi, abu daantengi. So on this little thing, Amni daantengi and abu, abu, Amni maarengi or abu daantengi. There was another version. Chal mere gode Hindustan. Hindustan ki pehli gali, jahan rehte Shokat Ali. Shokat Ali ko goli lagi, sari dunia rohne lagi. Che saal ke bachche ko kyun batana hai Shokat Ali ko goli lagi? गाड़ के मेरे सीने में नैनों के कई तीर ये मिस्रा है जस्ट क्लोज योर आईज एंड इमेजिन दिस दिस क्लोज योर आईज एक बड़ा मशहूर मिस्रा गाड़ के मेरे सीने में नैनों के कई तीर अगर आप इसकी इमेजरी ज़हन में लाएं तो क्या चीज़ बने व्हाई डू वी हैव टू डू दैट so from that tender age and that communication that we do with our children and normalize that in our literature, in everything, everything, that needs to change and that has to be a conscious effort. How do we do that? And that's where we have to start small. It's levels. Moving forward, moving forward. The appreciation that we receive, for instance, the first step as adults that we need to do is notice, recognize and appreciate when somebody works for peace or talks about peace. Notice, recognize, appreciate, repeat. Notice, recognize, appreciate, repeat. Why? When you notice something, when you recognize something, when you appreciate something, you celebrate it. And when you celebrate it, you create role models. And when you create role models, they inspire the upcoming generations. If you ask your children or your younger siblings, what are the superheroes they like? What names do you think they would be? Superman, Spider-Man, Batman or Wonder Woman? Because that's what they have seen on their lunch boxes, on their stickers, on their walls of their bedrooms. That's what they have seen being appreciated, celebrated, recognized. They might not take the name of Abdul Sitarini, Dr. Mutfa, Dr. Abdul Salam, because they have not seen them being appreciated the way they have otherwise seen. Why do we have to tell, tell our children? that flying in the air or sticking to the wall is a superpower. Why unconditional love, compassion, kindness without any discrimination? Why isn't this a superpower? And then we don't do that, we don't create those role models. So starting that small is something that we need to do. A paradigm shift and changing the narrative around those things. From communication to those elections. Changing the narrative. Little gestures while we're sitting here. If you just look at your right and left and smile for a few seconds. Of course without staring too much. <laughs> you would see 
a different energy in this auditory. You will feel that. That small, that, that starts not in that simple and that small. Moving forward, when we try to work on those issues, we begin our conversation from what we don't have. Jo nahi hai, ji ye nahi hai, wo nahi hai. And we tend to forget jo yehi hai. We tend to forget <laughs> our rich cultural values, forgotten values. Again, that dive into empirical data that convinces us that why do we need to be more kind from literature to religion to spiritual teachings to everything that has existed and exists right next to us, right within us. But we tend to focus on jo nahi hai rather than jo yehi. So how about we start small, we start appreciating, recognizing Noticing any single gesture of peace and we celebrate. Every year we see people being decorated with awards, national recognition. But how many of them, how many names do you know are of the people who are working for progress, inclusivity and mutual respect in the society? Any names? So that is something. And lastly, before I leave this stage, one of my favorite comments here. Nahi jaho sarvat. Nahi jaho sarvat na afla ko ishrat. Hamare tasaruf mein kuch bhi nahi hai. Nahi jaho sarvat na afla ko ishrat. Hamare tasaruf mein kuch bhi nahi hai. To kyu na muhabbat se aagaz kar dein. Jo humne basi hai. Yehi hai. So that is the message, my friends. Start from Jo Yehi Hai and stop complaining about Jo Nahi. Thank you very much.